In this discussion, we're going to talk about an approach to classroom assessment that balances various forms of assessment, criterion, norm referenced, formative, and summative assessment. Very importantly to remember, I want your assessment uh, to match your learning goals. I want you to make sure that you are assessing what you have appropriately taught to the students. It's not that one form of assessment is inherently better than another form of assessment, but one form of assessment might be better than another at measuring a particular learning goal or at measuring a particular task. So, I want you to carefully consider how your assessments can provide opportunities for students to demonstrate their understanding. That's the goal of assessment, as well as to provide feedback so that you can improve your instruction in that um, learning cycle, right? So you plan your instruction, you implement your instruction, you evaluate the effectiveness of your instruction, you assess whether students are making learning gains or not, and then you replan your next learning activities, learning lessons from assessment. And as you uh, watch the videos on Linda Darling Hammond, she's a major professor out of Stanford University. I strongly recommend that you always watch the supplemental videos that I provide for you. Uh, she'll talk about some of the uh, broader scope of assessment controversies in the field today that I'm not getting into for the purpose of this lecture, because otherwise I'd make this discussion very long if I get into some of the um, broader field controversies. So first we'll talk about criterion reference testing. A criterion reference test basically measures um, a student's performance against a certain criteria or a certain benchmark. Sometimes you guys have heard of benchmark testing. That's what a, a criterion is. You're basically seeing does a, a student master a particular skill or, per, or a particular knowledge level according to a particular criteria that you're setting. So, oftentimes, criteria reference tests will measure what's the effectiveness of instruction. Now, sometimes that's used to measure the effectiveness of a particular teacher for pay raise purposes and so forth. That gets into controversies because there's all kinds of variables that come into play uh, in terms of quality of instruction. But what we often will also do is we'll measure learning gains. For instance, let's say response intervention. Uh, if a student takes um, what's called a curriculum-based measurement, CBM, which is a type of criterion referenced assessment often used in, in RTI. Um, and I'll let you look up, I'll, I'll give you some supplemental stuff on CBMs. But uh, let's say that a student has been struggling and then you give a short curriculum-based measurement. A curriculum-based measurement is basically a test of whether a student is making learning gains based upon what has been taught in the curriculum um, when it comes to um, goals such as phonics improvement or vocabulary improvement or it can sometimes be used in other subject areas such as math improvement. Um, if the student is making adequate gains then the instruction appears to be effective. If the student is not making appropriate gains, then you might want to adjust your instruction. It means that the instruction is not benefiting the student adequately. Um, and it might mean also that we need to go to tier two levels of intervention in the RTI model. Remember those three tiers of intervention in RTI. So there are some advantages to criterion reference tests. Um, the students are not competing against each other because remember this is benchmark testing. You're not uh, trying to um, see who measures against whom. Potentially everyone can meet the criteria and everyone can make the A here. Um, and so based upon that, if you want students to help each other in a learning community, it's more uh, likely that students will help each other. You also have some disadvantages. Uh, sometimes it's difficult to set standards in areas such as language arts, um, writing. Um, if you're trying to do creativity, it's really difficult to set standards for th things like creativity. And 
Uh, sometimes if a teacher is making a criterion reference test, then it can be a little bit arbitrary. Obviously, um, there are criterion reference tests out there such as CBMs that have been normed and that they are not arbitrary. Uh, so that depends on whether it's a teacher made or a um, criterion based test that's not teacher made. Next, let's get into norm reference tests. Norm reference tests basically norm, uh, rank students compared to level of achievement, such as um, uh, so and so scores in uh, the 95th percentile of achievement in reading skill. That might mean better than 95% of other uh, students who took that particular test, right? Uh, according to a certain grade level. Uh, oftentimes it is expressed as a percentile. Um, and student achievement is usually reported in broad skill areas, phonics, vocabulary, literacy overall, reading comprehension overall, for instance. And items are selected to discriminate against high achievers versus low achievers. So you can, um, if someone is scoring um, below 50% of grade level um, readers, then of course that means that that student is struggling in reading. Uh, so you can see some of the differences in purposes and content here of norm versus criterion reference tests. Uh, basically, norm reference test is comparing um, against a normal group of students, a particular age or grade level. Criterion reference test is testing against a benchmark. Um, and of course, which one is more appropriate for you to use depends on what your goal is, what you're trying to find out. So, of course, in a criterion reference test, each individual student is uh, compared with a preset standard or a preset benchmark, um, and the score is usually um, described as a percentile. Oftentimes, these is uh, criterion reference test is otherwise known as benchmark testing. Um, and, of course, norm reference testing, you're comparing them against their normal age group or normal grade group for a particular level of performance. Each has their advantages disadvantages depends on what you want to learn as a teacher. So norm reference testing um, can get into assessing general ability of students, their range of ability in let's say literacy or math. Usually you're talking about comparison to a very large group of students, um, oftentimes in the tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands in terms of comparison. The level of statistical analysis that's involved in norm reference testing, you really have to have a large group of students that you're uh, comparing it to. Whereas criterion reference testing, um, it's a preset mastery uh, benchmark that you're trying to determine. Next, let's get into formative assessment. Formative assessment is basically oftentimes uh, described as assessment for learning. It's very interactive. You can do it on the spot while you're teaching. You can go around groups. You can uh, take little observational assessments. Um, for those of you that have studied, uh, for instance, running records, uh, an approach to assessment uh, pioneered by uh, Mari Clay, that's a type of formative assessment used in literacy. Uh, those of you that are in elementary or early childhood might have studied those, um, for instance. And, um, if you're so, and again, we're this is not. I'm not getting into the pros and cons of. Um, running records for the purpose of this assessment. I'm just simply saying that's one type if you've studied them. Um, usually the information is uh, used to give you feedback about how are students doing um, and what can you do to improve their instruction. It's And oftentimes you can help students understand how to monitor their own assessment gains, how to monitor their own progress so that students will take ownership of it. Some key elements of formative assessment here, um, you uh, will try to uh, use it to do identification of learning goals. Are students making learning outcomes or not? 
Um, oftentimes you can engage in reach conversation and coaching with the students as you're dealing with results of your formative assessment or you can even do formative assessment in the midst of a coaching session with your students. Um, you, it's very timely, it's very on the spot uh, type, of, uh, type of assessment, it's very active um, and like I said you want to ideally get this into a place where the teacher and the student are working together hand in hand as a team in this type of assessment. It tends to occur during instruction, during class time. It can also occur in between lessons. Um, now research shows that too often times teachers oftentimes neglect formative assessment in favor of summative assessment that I'll uh, soon discuss. You don't want to neglect formative assessment. You also don't want to neglect a summative assessment. You want a good combination of these uh, different types. Effective use of formative assessment includes uh, make sure that you know, your formative assessment is aligned with the standards that you're trying to measure. Remember, assessment should match what you're trying to teach. Um, it should match what you already have taught. Um, if you're doing a pretest or assessment of their learning before you teach a certain material, then it should match what you're planning to teach. Oftentimes, it does help you to know um, what do students know ahead of time. Um, about a particular subject before you teach that subject. Um, the assessment should provide really good, timely, useful information um, that's thick, rich, and enough detail that you can have a good conversation with the student in terms of feedback and that it can really effectively inform your own instructional choices. The purpose of formative assessment in a nutshell is to promote further improvement of student learning um, in the process of student learning taking place. It's very action oriented. It's, um, and ideally, you want to have conversations with the student so the student understands the purpose of assessment himself or herself and so the student can take ownership. Um, of the thing and you want to make sure that you're providing good information on what the student needs. Um, involve the student in practicing. Um, involve the student in um, why we're practicing a certain skill, why we're reteaching something, what are we going to learn next. You want it to be very collaborative with the student. Some benefits of formative assessments include, um, ideally, if the student is actively involved, that helps motivation and self-responsibility and um, planning ahead and monitoring one's own learning. Effective. Uh, you want to make sure that it's very much aligned, make sure that you match what's been taught again. Make sure that you are carefully providing students with clear, understandable learning goals and learning targets. The student should understand, here's what I'm supposed to learn. Here's why I'm supposed to learn it. Here's how I'm supposed to learn it. Here are actions that I can do in my um, writing or in my reading or in my math or whatever uh, so that I can demonstrate whether I'm learning or not. Here are adjustments I can make based upon that. And ideally, give students examples of good work and bad work, um, high quality quality writing, uh, for instance, that the student can use as a model uh, to monitor progress and something to shoot toward. You want to give good, strong feedback to the student so that you can help guide the student to how to monitor his own progress or her own progress. Finally, let's get into summative assessment. Summative assessment is basically assessment of the learning that has taken place. It's, for instance, unit exams, chapter exams, your final exams at the end of the course. These are examples of summative assessment. So you can see a comparison here between formative and summative assessment. Formative assessment can take the play, can take the form of asking questions to students and ideally take notes. Um, what are you observing uh, later on? Um, classroom discussions, you can monitor um, the answers being provided by students in the midst of discussions and you can find patterns that emerge. You can interview your students, you can, have, you can engage the student in a self-assessment. 
Uh, by comparison, summative assessments uh, tend to be multiple choice, true, false, matching. They tend to be standardized. You can also do um, extended written response performative assessments too in, um, when we talk about summative assessments. Again, some more uh, comparison here. Oftentimes, formative assessment um, is not graded. It's very informal. It's very process-oriented, and it's ongoing. It's continuous. Um, by contrast, summative assessment tends to be graded, oftentimes for a pretty high grade. When we're talking about a final exam, it uh, tends to occur at the end of an activity or at the end of a unit. Uh, for instance, it's, it's much more evaluative as opposed to performative. Oftentimes, we might use multiple choice tests. Think very carefully about the use of multiple choice tests. It's not that they're bad or good. They're just bad or good depending on what purpose you're using them for. Um, so uh, some advantages of multiple choice tests are that um, you can create kind of a test item bank, uh, and oftentimes you can draw on that test item bank, so that's very easy to use. If you're drawing on a bank that's been examined by experts in the field, you might have highly valid uh, test banks. Remember, um, validity gets into, does it test what you're supposed to be testing? Reliability gets into, uh, if more than one person were to uh, grade the responses of students, will, more than, uh, will these people give consistent grades? Um, give consistent analysis. Um, and ideally, you want your tests to be both rely reliable and valid, especially when they're high stakes. Um, formative assessment gets a little bit more difficult when we talk about reliability and ability for, uh, because oftentimes formative assessments can be um, rather subjective. And so um, if you are um, doing a multiple choice well, you will have high reliability because there's only one possible answer. So of course everyone's gonna everyone grading this will agree this is the correct answer or this or this is not. And so it tends to be very objective as opposed to subjective, right? Um, and you can do mo multiple choice testing for mass testing. We do that all the time. And it can be very precise. There are also some distinct disadvantages uh, to using uh, multiple choice. Oftentimes, uh, we get into lower levels of knowledge, um, uh, for instance, recognition and recall, as opposed to synthesis or creativity. It would be pretty darn hard uh, to be creative on a multiple choice test or even get into synthesis on a multiple choice test. Um, and there is a high reliability on reading ability which can mean, for instance, that, for instance, let's say that you're giving a math test uh, to a student. Um, it's possible that, and I've said this before in previous videos, it's possible that an English language learner who is highly skilled in math might score low on that math test because of misreading uh, the directions or misreading a um, and misreading a problem or misreading the way that something was taught because of difficulties in um, making the transition from the first language to the second language. Uh, so that gets into um, and that gets into validity, whether the test is testing what it's supposed to test. Uh, because in such a case that I just told you about, um, you're actually testing um, the knowledge of English, you're not actually testing math, even though you're supposed to be testing math in this case that I just told you. So be careful about that. That can be one disadvantage of multiple choice tests. And another disadvantage that I don't have here is that if you're drawing on a test bank uh, of multiple choice test questions, sometimes if you're choosing um, predetermined, pre-written multiple choice test questions, they might not be valid uh, because they might not actually test what you taught. They might not be aligned with what you taught. And so be careful about using test banks. I'm not saying never use test banks. I'm saying be careful. There's a difference between those uh, statements. Um, and on the other hand, sometimes teachers will create their own multiple choice tests 
Now, if you're creating your own multiple choice test, now you get into issues of reliability and ability because it's much, it's much more difficult for an individual teacher, especially if that teacher hasn't been highly trained in creation of assessments. Um, it, it's much more difficult for that teacher to ensure that that uh, test is still reliable and valid. Reliable meaning that if multiple people were to grade the test, they'd, they'd agree on the answers. You can generally have really high reliability even in a teacher-generated multiple choice test because you've only got one right answer anyway. But sometimes if you write it poorly, um, you could choose the one right answer that you yourself accept as a teacher, but other people grading that will say, now wait a second, you might be wrong as a teacher, right? Um, and sometimes that happens all the time. Um, also when it comes to validity, um, it's possible that you that the teacher generated test that you created um, might not adequately test what you taught there might be errors that you made uh, in that regard and so it's a it's it's much more difficult and it's much more time consuming uh, to design a highly reliable and valid multiple choice test as a teacher uh, now, um, we get into the difference between objective and subjective assessment as we prepare to close this video. Uh, so, objective assessment, such as multiple choice, um, has only one single answer. A subjective assessment, such as a creative writing activity, may have more than one correct answer or more than one way of expressing um, the response. There are advantages and disadvantages. Essay, short answer, creative writing. These are examples of subjective tests. The question may have one correct answer or one or more than one way of of, of writing it. May be possible multiple modes of writing it. For instance, visual um, versus linguistic, for instance. Um, and this involves the teacher uses his or her own judgment. I highly, highly recommend rubrics when you give subjective tests because if you're if you're giving a student an a b c d or f um on a subjective test without a rubric and it's entirely your judgment then you can get into a student feeling like your grading was unfair pretty quickly there are some advantages of subjective tests. You can get into both the affective, meaning judgment and emotion, as well as the interpretive aspects of the student's learning and the student's expression. Um, a synthesis, creativity, uh, can come into play with, uh, better with a subjective test. Um, and you can get into student innovation much better uh, when it comes to subjective tests. Problem solving, uh, for instance, can be um, expressed much better on a subjective test. But there are also um, some definitive uh, disadvantages and concerns here. Uh, for instance, oftentimes your reliability might be low. Reliability, remember, um, for instance, let's say hypothetically you have three different teachers uh, within your professional learning community come together to jointly grade student responses. If it's a multiple choice test, boom, they should, they should all agree. Uh, it's pretty easy because you've only got one, one correct answer. And so it's pretty easy to get high reliability on a multiple choice test. But if you've got students uh, doing a test where they're problem solving or where they're being creative, uh, now all of a sudden you might have uh, these three different teachers giving different grades, even if you've used a rubric. And so reliability can be uh, more problematic uh, when it comes to a subjective test. And sometimes students will just find ways of evading um, from a, a test answer, a test question, if they're not um, if they don't really know the answer, they might find ways of bluffing their way uh, through the answer. So that's another possible disadvantage. So hopefully this helps you. I made this a relatively brief video compared to some of my others that have been an hour long. Um, again, the key is it's not that any one of these types of tests are absolutely better than the other. Choose the type of assessment that you use carefully based upon what your goals are.
and use all of these forms of assessment. Now, I have not discussed diagnostic assessment in this video because honestly speaking, as general education teachers, you guys are not gonna be involved in specialized uh, diagnostic assessment of learning disabilities or what specific aspects of phonemic awareness or phonics or so forth might be causing the student to have trouble with reading. That gets into specialized training uh, that the reading specialist or dyslexia specialist might possess. Uh, so hopefully this helps you. Take care.